on the subject and uh, today uh, with your uh, constant guidance with your great contribution uh, uh, dr gupta we've been uh, able to uh, uh, reach a day where we are organizing the fourth in the series of otps and uh, uh, with a very um, suitable theme and i i congratulate you for advising us um and compliment you for suggesting this particular thing which is industrial safety planning and management one of the key uh, it sounds very basic but one of the key uh, areas which will be covered in these three days uh, over to you uh, professor gupta before we formally start uh, a few comments from you sir uh, thank you uh, rubab ji and uh, uh, respected uh, uh, general bhardwaj saab who has been the kind of a backbone of this initiative and uh, major general manoj kumar bindal ed and idm both uh, uh, general uh, general uh, bardwaj is joined or uh, he he will be joining he'll be joining at the moment very soon he will be joining okay yes. okay so so i express the gratitude to both of them in absentia they will be joining us uh, shortly uh, i compliment uh, the the team cidm and fiki team uh, uh, mr ruab akhil sanjeev uh, varun and and uh, other colleagues from uh, from fiki and uh, from an idm side uh, my colleagues uh, dr anjali and uh, mr harshit and uh, all the resource persons because this is a this is a big team in fact manak is uh, smiling uh, manak has uh, been uh, very instrumental uh, in many of the initiatives are here also uh, so so uh, i'm happy that our team is also growing uh as as ruba was referring to uh, that this is the fourth otp in the series so uh, each and every topic uh, when when we theme that we choose for uh, the, the training program uh, then we also uh, we also associate uh, uh, significant experts uh, who are having national and international expertise so so that, uh, this is also uh, uh, strategically important that we are strengthening a very important team uh, on uh, various dimensions of uh, chemical industrial disaster management and uh, by by uh, by the way of uh, these otp as uh, otps and uh, a series of webinars i think we could reach to to more than uh, more than 10000 uh, uh, participants and uh, across the country uh, over past uh, uh, four or five months so this cooperation between fiki and an idm uh, has uh, is going a long way and has to uh, go a long way because the subject of industrial chemical disaster management uh, which uh, has uh, i would say uh, uh, got a little uh, kind of a, uh, some some weakness in the pace and now with uh, uh, our joining hands and uh, with the support of uh, industry because uh, Uh, after a few incidences that took place during this uh, uh, coronavirus lockdown phase and when the industry started uh, after after the lockdown uh, the the awakening is uh, great and people themselves the industry uh, the industry members and uh, the senior authorities of industries and the uh, the professionals working within the industry and for the industry uh, they have taken this matter very seriously that uh, the uh, industrial uh, accident management and uh, industrial disaster risk management uh, is a very important dimension which has uh, both technical as well as managerial uh, dimensions which are important and that is why uh, we uh, we thought that after a series of three uh, training programs where we covered technical dimensions as well as uh, the legal and regulatory framework also the, the previous one was that uh, on that uh how how to use uh, this both knowledge technical uh, uh, knowledge of risk management as well as when we have a reg uh, regulatory framework so how we uh, we put it uh, put both in, in a blended form into practice for that actually we require uh, prudent planning and and this prudent planning or effective planning uh, uh, in 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 the form of uh, uh, this uh, that it starts in fact uh from from the design its stage itself and then we have uh, designated uh, uh, the kind of a, uh, plans also for example on site emergency plan off site emergency plan but besides this 
disaster management plan is also an integral component component of uh, EIA and EMP, and and yes. and uh, and also uh, with, within within the government system, we have uh, we have uh, disaster uh, risk assessment as a part of the uh, project appraisal process. So so that is very interesting. So how to look at uh, multidisciplinary angle of uh, this uh, planning and management issues of industrial safety uh, in uh, in uh, uh, within within uh, the industry and when we say industry it is again a vast gamut uh, uh, from from the investment point of view uh, from from the physical uh, uh, extent point of view but also uh, the type of uh, uh, type of activities involved. So whether it's process industry, uh, manufacturing, construction, mining. So a range of industries are there, and each and every type of industry would require a different set. So so hmm. this uh, this program will be focusing on uh, 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 health, occupational health dimensions, risk assessment, uh, auditing. Also, it will touch. So several important dimensions will be touched upon in this uh, course. Uh, so so. Uh, uh, I'm very happy uh, over this development and I shall look forth at the successful uh, conduct of this program. Thank you and over to you, Rubab, again. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Professor uh, Gupta, for, for setting the perspective and giving us a, giving all the, the, the participants who've joined us the, the very uh, uh, relevant background on, of, of, of industrial safety and how important it is in, 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 uh, uh, in today's time. And it could not have been uh, a better time for us to discuss this subject when we uh, are not only going through a challenging COVID, uh, crisis, but moving on, looking forward, I think the industrialization uh, has only one path to follow, which is of growth. And uh, when we are uh, post, uh, even, even during COVID time, you know, uh, the the level of industrialization, which will, uh, you know, India is one of those countries which is looking forward to faster growth in industries and industrialization post covid phase uh, because of the opportunities which our ecosystem provides to industry not only in india but uh, for foreign players as well so and and in fact very interestingly uh, i would like to share it with all the participants who have joined us that during recent uh, uh, jkml lecture uh, at iit rukki and the inaugural lecture was given by none other than uh, Dr. P.K. Mishra, who's the principal secretary to, to the Honorable Prime Minister. Um, and he, talk about, he talked about Black Swan events. Black Swan events. And uh, one of the things which he mentioned while talking about COVID was chemical incidents, chemical disasters, out of the four major issues which he brought up. So the leadership also is looking into this subject with utmost uh, seriousness, utmost... Uh, 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 you know, uh, relevance, and uh, I am sure uh, we this the, these small steps which we are taking in that direction of of building and improving capacities among industries will be well noted uh, by the by the, the, the not only the leadership but by the concerned uh, uh, ministries and departments. And it has happened that over the last seven eight months, the kind of support. Uh, we have received from the concerned ministries and departments has been overwhelming. Starting from, uh, I mean, I'm sure NIDM and uh, you know that has definitely enhanced the entire uh, you know uh, partnership model uh, you know uh, of CNDM. But uh, we are really uh, proud to be associated, and I think uh, we are just uh, making those small steps of building a better system, better ecosystem, safer ecosystem in the country for industries to operate and for the work phase, workforce to, to, to work. Uh, on that note, I think uh, General Bhardwaj is on a call from uh, NDMA. I think there was some urgent uh, discussion which the Secretary is uh, having with him. So General Bhardwaj will join us. Uh, my colleague Varun uh, is, is following up with him, in, is in close touch with him. So uh, okay. without uh, 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 taking any more time, sir, I think we can uh, uh, formally, we have already touched the 300 marks, sir. So we are at yeah. 298. So uh, thank you so much. I think uh, to all the participants. Uh, I think we've got some technical trouble. Uh, Sanjeev, you can take over.
Sun, good afternoon. Yeah, good afternoon, sir. Actually, uh, yeah, Ruba yeah. is back. Ruba is back. back, back. Yes. Yeah. yeah, this time he is back with the video also. Yeah. yeah. Video, great, great. So, yeah, your Ruba, your voice is not coming. Please, please unmute yourself. Voice. Rubav, your voice is not coming. I think he is still facing some trouble. So Sanjeev, you can you can invite uh, yeah. the next dignitary. We can we can move ahead. I, I I'm just checking with Rubav uh, for a minute only, and then okay if, okay yeah. all right all right all right please check. आप आपकी आवाज नहीं आ रही है आपका वीडियो आ रहा है तो आप प्लीज स्टार्ट करिए आइए वीडियो करके अब जन भादवा सर भी आ गए हैं भादवा सर भी आ गए हैं ठीक है सर नमस्कार वेलकम नमस्कार जी नमस्कार जी हाउ आर यू ऑल गुड आफ्टरनून आई हैड सम टेक्निकल डिफिकल्टीज इन ज्वाइनिंग दो वाज ट्राइंग टू ज्वाइन एट 225 बट आई डोंट नो होस्ट हैज म्यूटेड मी एंड आल्सो डिसेबल्ड मी एज़ फॉर द वीडियो इज कंसर्न्ड एनीवे ऑल इज वेल दैट एंड्स वेल सो आई हैव ज्वाइंड द गुड मीटिंग स्टार्टिंग टुडे सर गुप्ता जी यू हैव फिनिश्ड Yes sir yes sir yes sir yes sir Rubab. yes sir Rubab. Rubab has been coordinating sir he now got some technical issue so so sir uh, 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 sanjeev sanjeev you can welcome sir you can request sir rubab is Rubab's back rubab is, Rubab is back very good afternoon jal uh, bhardwaj thank you so much uh, for joining yes i can hear you ji yeah. Rubab, you are not audible. Something wrong with your. Uh, Rubab uh, is also facing some technical uh, difficulty. Rubab is facing. Uh, uh, Sanjeev, Sanjeev ji, आप सर को request करिए. हाँ सर, ठीक है. Anyway, I don't require any. Uh, sir, yes sir. Yeah, sir, you you <laughs> you you are the backbone of this initiative. So uh, yeah, yes sir. So your blessings are always important for all of us and. Uh, all the participants are also uh, eager to listen to your uh, thank you so topic. much uh, i'm uh, equally very happy to join this sports training program with the nidm and uh, uh, the, the nidm with uh, joining hands with fiki this this platform uh, cid platform is doing wonderful job during the time of covid and uh, thanks to general uh, bindal and uh, professor anil gupta that they have been very active in during this period and uh, Uh, so our listeners also must be thinking that uh, nidm is so active as it has always been there sir. now today's uh, uh, meeting uh, this three days program is uh, focuses very important topics as you all know uh, we have not covered earlier the health part so very important lecture on the medical preparedness and uh, uh, on the occupational health in addition to the safety issue now biggest uh, uh, today concern that we noticed during the in the chemical industry during covid was the safety issue and safety whenever there is no safety it results into lots of problems in the health matters and uh, uh, even now the ndma has started uh, reviewing the national guidelines which we issued in 2007 whether they require certain important importance uh, of laying further stress on safety issues and medical preparedness 
medical preparedness of course was a comprehensive part uh, for the chemical industry also but i think uh, uh, general uh, guidelines which we laid down in 2007 uh, probably <coughs> do require a little revision and we will be doing it very soon already a panel has been established and uh, cidm forum is participating in that in it of course uh, nidm must be the core person to also address that and uh, once the new guidelines come they will be certainly improved over the guidelines that we issued in 2007 from ndma uh, i uh, uh, wish uh, great success for this conference today and uh, uh, i am very sure that uh, this will continue uh, the training programs for chemical industry will continue not only on safety issues but there are other issues planning and uh, yes, uh, rehabilitation and uh, resettlement and uh, you see there is another issue in the with the chemical industry is the uh, uh, general insurance part and uh, uh, making up the losses of the industry uh, yes. those issues have to be also covered in the national guidelines how to go about it because most of the industry maximum industries in our country especially the uh, mh units are in the private sector and therefore we must address something from the government side that how do we deal with a major disaster when there is big, big loss to the industry and uh, to the people so what should be the mechanism i also have noticed that though the national guidelines stand and uh, various instructions from ndma and idm they are issued from time to time but there is a lack what i felt was the preparation of sops on various issues in the industry <laughs> follow up or those sops for uh, not only safety but for each action and also contemplating uh, abnormal situations like covid because we never thought that covid will come and sudden lockout will take place and uh, we will not be able to attend how to stock the uh, store the gases and all those things uh, when normally it is being constantly done under low temperature and if you shut down an industry and every person disappears to from the uh, site then it's difficult to sort that out so those kind of sops are further necessary in that case you all know the chemical industry is huge subject in addition to the transportation and as cams and various type of changing scenario now safer chemicals are uh, being advocated in place of the older ones so i think uh, uh lots of issues are there and the peace training programs can address those issues i am very thankful to uh, rubab and party who are part of my cidm team and uh, they have been very active and actually they get restless when there was gap in between of not holding the conferences i mean uh, uh, the training programs and conferences as we used to have every a uh, quarter or so previously but anyway the good time will again come and we'll have physical conferences be held in future also uh, i i wish the uh, this print trading program a great success and i am very sure that all the participants will are going to gain a lot jai hind thank you thank you sir thank you so much uh, uh, jal bhardwaj i hope i'm audible now sanjeev yes 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 thank you so much general bhardwaj for all your, uh, your your blessings your guidance your support and uh, your leadership most importantly in in helping us drive the cidm initiative uh, uh, all the way and also collaborating with uh, the renowned institutes like nidm uh, and 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 uh, you know getting into a partnership of of which is of great significance and of national importance and something what we have proved under your leadership in the last uh, uh seven to eight months um your constant dialogue with uh, the ed and idm uh general bindal uh on the subject of promoting industrial safety in the country uh has been uh, uh you know uh, main guiding source for the entire cidm team and also i'm sure uh, professor gupta will will echo the same um and yeah. i'm sure this is just a beginning sir and we'll continue working on 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 uh, uh the 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 path which you have set for us and uh, under your guidance we will we'll try and make uh, whatever contribution we can uh, under this partnership of making industries safer and the operations safer in this country along with the workforce 
thank you so much uh, general bhardwaj for thank your you. very uh, inspiring and and motivating uh, uh, address sir thank you so much thank, thank you. you thank you, thank you. Uh, 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 sir I, i think due to some personal exigency uh, uh, general bindal had to uh, to he could not uh, be seen here but uh, i'm sure uh, on his behalf uh, uh, professor gupta would like to 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 make make a comment sir uh, over to you, uh, 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 professor gupta yeah uh, general B uh, major general bindal he was uh, very much uh, keen to join this program but uh, he has some uh, some unavoidable uh, uh, work at home so so he could not join but he has conveyed his personal regards to uh, general bhardwaj sir and all the resource persons and best wishes to the team and he will join uh, some of the day as per uh, convenience so uh, and uh, Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, General Bardwaj sir, for uh, always being uh, uh, a guiding force for all of us and blessing uh, this uh, initiative of uh, cooperation between CIDM, FICI, and uh, NIDM. And your kind words are always uh, the source of energy for all of us. Uh, and being the being the main architect of the the the, the national guidelines on chemical industrial disaster management. uh so just to inform you that uh, now we are starting uh, uh, to develop a national uh, disaster management plan for ministry of uh, environment and forests also so so uh, uh, the initiative that you had set for developing a national action plan on chemical disaster management so that that is also being worked out and this experience of uh, this joint programs between fiki and idm and cidm uh the the issues which are emerging from this uh, these uh, training programs and uh, webinars so those are also very important insights for uh, that kind of planning process also and improving those uh, planning process uh, as uh, we all are aware that uh, uh, it is likely that the issues of industrial chemical safety uh, will be transferred to the ministry of chemicals and fertilizers department of chemicals and petrochemicals so so that transition also we are witnessing Uh, but uh, uh, whether it is uh, with ministry of environment or whether it is with ministry of chemicals all the ministries are uh, uh, are open to co collaborate and uh, work with us so that is that is a kind of a uh, uh, indication of the importance of the subject being realized within the government within the industry and uh, within within the set of professional institutions like uh, uh, fiki uh, is also collaborating uh, with us also and uh, a number of Uh, top academic institutions in the country for, for example including iit iits ism uh, medical institutions so so uh, this is uh, really developing a kind of a consortium so so that is a very good initiative and uh, with this uh, uh, i welcome all the all the resource persons and all the participants once again and i hope that this program would be of uh, of uh, significant uh, uh, contributions to to all of us thank you Thank you so much, Good. Professor Gupta, for your uh, 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 for your comments and you know for your address on behalf of I'm sure the, you echo the views of uh, Major General M K Bindal, um, uh, who's been a great source of uh, uh, again uh, inspiration and motivation for for this entire partnership. Uh, think uh, moving on, uh, I would quickly before I request you for your lead uh, um, lecture. uh professor i would just like to uh, share with all the participants now we have almost 315 number that uh, we as organizers will be issuing a, a, a certificate a joint certificate by nidm and fiki and the uh, you know for all the participants who attend all the three days of the training program online training program, along with the the presentations you know which have been uh, presented or delivered during these three days a copy of that presentation will also be presentation will also be shared with these participants it is mandatory for all the participants to attend all three days of the otp program to be uh, eligible for a certificate which would be jointly issued by nidm and fiki cidm both uh as i request now uh, uh, uh and uh, professor anil kumar uh, for his uh, lead lecture i would just like to set the perspective 
uh, you know, from a very industry's point of view, that you know, in a day and age where people still get injured on job, uh, you would think safety would be a banner held high by everyone. But unfortunately, it isn't up there on the priority for industry in certain cases. Money and apathy seem to be the two leading reasons why safety sometimes takes the back seat. The importance of workplace safety can't be stressed enough. So putting safety in the driver's seat is a winning proposition for everybody, you know, for certain reasons, which includes that it's, you know, industrial safety and measures taken in this area not only avoids injury and death, or financial uh, loss, uh, it also helps uh, save property damage and uh, proper industrial safety training, uh, uh, which is uh, you know disseminated, can lead to productivity increase, service or quality of the products also improves, and most importantly, one of the very important things which the management needs to look into is that it improves the corporate reputation and the public relation also. So uh, we have great minds and great experts who will be talking on this subject in the in, in the coming three days, starting with none other than Professor Gupta. So uh, I'm not a big, uh, I'm not a, uh, not an expert on this, but uh, I would look forward to hearing from the experts directly, starting with uh, uh, Professor Gupta. Before I request him to take over, a brief introduction of Dr. Anil Gupta. Uh, uh, he's a resilience and sustainability strategist who has worked for the government industry and academia for over 25 years. Presently, he's a professor of India's National Institute of Disaster Management. He has steered several international and national projects of policy planning and research, and published over 25 books and 70 papers. He is WMO expert team member of on climate uh, statement, South Asia core group member of IUCN CEM and vice chair of Association of Occupational and Environmental Health and editor of Springer Nature book series on disaster resilience. With his immense experience on the subject, I think we all are looking forward to your to your to your uh, presentation and to your lead lecture. Over to you, Professor Gupta. Thank you. Thank you, Ruva, for uh, inviting me and for uh, uh, introducing me to the uh, to the participants. And uh, uh, since uh, this training program is uh, uh, after my, my my talk, it is going to be followed by uh, uh, the very specific topics to be covered by the subject experts. Uh, I, I chosen to give a little overview and also uh, also, uh, some glimpses on uh, on on the importance and the mechanisms of risk assessment because uh, within the disaster management system, the entire story uh, begins from recognizing the challenge. So that is the first step. Uh, step that how efficiently and how prudently we uh, we recognize, uh, we identify, we recognize, and we analyze uh, the risk and risk scenarios. So that sets the tone for 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 uh, for the disaster management planning, and then uh, management by implementing that plans. So thank you for allowing me to share my presentation. I am, uh, uh, yeah. Is my PowerPoint visible? Uh, Sanjeev. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Visible. Yes, sir. Visible. Yes, sir. Thank yes, sir. You. Yes, sir. Thank we you. can we can see. Yeah. Thank you. So so as uh, as Mr. Rua was also referring to that. Uh, how industrial safety and disaster risk management also uh, contrib contributes to the, the corporate, uh, the prestige of the corporate uh, uh, houses or the industrial houses. So uh, I, I, I would say that I look uh, the industrial chemical disaster management or disaster management in general, uh, including now the experience of COVID also uh, for industry as, as a business sustainability strategy, because uh, now in COVID, we had seen the kind of ups and downs, and not only ups and downs, but severe uh, disruptions of many of the business and industrial entities. So, so disaster management is emerging as a very, very important dimension of the business continuity management, as well as business sustainability strategy. And uh, 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 this is just a glimpse of uh, the importance of chemical industrial disaster management that uh, we, we can see. Uh, the the missile man of the day after uh, uh, Dr. Late uh, Dr. Kalam, uh, he was the next to him and uh, releasing a resource book on uh, chemical industrial disaster management. 
now this is uh, this is uh, the the uh, uh, framework uh, showing the paradigm shift uh, that more, uh, for quite a long time our focus has been on emergency response within disaster management yes emergency response is still very very important because uh, when incident takes place so so counter disaster measures are uh, containing the incident uh, to to not not allow it to to cause uh, severe damage or uh, on health in terms of uh, the uh, morbidity and mortality uh, that is that is important but uh, what is important that we start looking at uh, the disaster management as a management subject and that is why this wheel the first wheel is bigger because this requires lot of planning process lot of uh, lot of analytic analytical exercises and even discourses also lot of discussions and then regular improvement kind of things also uh then 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 we recognize that uh, despite of the best efforts of preventing and mitigate uh, mitigating a, a disaster risk uh, there will always remain a uh, some kind of a residual risk that that also be relate with the concept of risk acceptance criteria so so we say that acceptable risk so what risk that accept and uh, on the on the other term we call it the residual risk that uh, the, the remaining risk we need to prepare for the dealing with that kind of emergency so so this is this is the new uh, approach globally where we are giving uh, a little more emphasis on risk management and then getting uh, more prudently ready uh, to 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 manage our operations more effectively so that we can reduce the losses and damage now talking about uh, industries uh, for quite a long time uh, when we were uh, talking about the safety within industry though so uh fire and explosion that has been the top uh, consideration because uh, many of you must be aware that uh, we start with the dow and mon index kind of thing that uh, what kind of material how much uh, material and what is the uh, risk of fire and explosion uh, but uh, a number of incidences that took place including the bhopal disaster so how toxic release uh, the uh, release of toxic gas or release of toxic liquid are in other forms so uh, that 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 can uh, lead to a major challenge and take the form of an accident and then disaster then corrosion also uh, many many times the corrosion of pipelines and these kind of things then we also added radioactivity but beside this we cannot ignore when we are discussing about industrial uh, safety and disaster management within the industrial premises then mechanical mishaps and electrical accidents cannot be ruled out on the other hand we also listed a number of Uh, the number of natural uh, hazard factors that also contributes to the disruption within the industry because now we are we are talking uh, for disaster management as as a measure for business continuity management and business sustainability management and therefore we need to recognize these kind of natural hazard factors and sometimes natural hazard factors and the man made or the technological hazard factors Uh, are are reacting with each other are combining with each other and creating a major catastrophic scenario for example what happened in fukushima that a technological uh, mis- a, te- a natural factor uh, led to led to uh, led to uh, uh, that earthquake led to uh, uh, tsunami then tsunami caused flooding and then uh, then finally it affected the nuclear power plant and it was a nuclear uh, mishap so so how uh, these kind of uh, disasters which in other terms sometimes we call it complex emergency are not tech disasters natural induced technological disasters are also equally important even in uh, uh, the the china earthquake also there were uh, severe damage to to underground uh, chemical storages and chemical industries even bhuj earthquake also has affected chemical uh, industrial uh, plants in orissa super cyclone also a number of uh, uh, chemical storages have been affected and even in the port area also there has there were uh, the incidences of uh, significant chemical hazardous chemical spillage so these kind of incidences were also there now we are also listing terrorism as potential threat because uh, sometimes the terrorist attack uh, can also lead to a major a major uh, technological uh, catastrophe or technological mishap Uh, because by, by by releasing uh, hazardous uh, or obnoxious materials so uh, but beside this uh, 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 it is very important to refer to the trigger mechanism 
because any major accident takes place once uh, the hazardous material or the material that has a potential to catch fire or cause explosion or uh, if release is of uh, the, the uh, corrosive nature or, or the uh, or, or the, uh, uh, the toxic uh, nature of the material so that requires actually a trigger a trigger mechanism and trigger event is very important uh, when we, we when we carry out uh, the, uh, the, the process of risk assessment, whether it is a pre-incident risk assessment or post-incident accident analysis uh, kind of thing that what actually caused the trigger. So, so it may be a process or a storage system failure uh, or uh, the instantaneous bulk release of the pollutants or contaminants. This, this, this is a coming picture uh, re very recently when uh, sometimes even the, the failure of the, uh, the EP, ETP or STP can also cause Sometimes the mass released from the natural sources, for example, from the pyrite rocks, uh, there were uh, incidences where some people died because of the release of hazardous gases from the natural areas also. Then spillage from the hazardous waste, then spillage are released from the transport or shipping. Uh, 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 natural calamities, uh, I already discussed about terrorist attack also. Then there were also a number of incidences of mass poisoning, whether, uh, whether uh, intentional or unintentional, that a large number of people have been served some food, but because of the poisoning, many of the people got uh, ill or, or, or they, they got, uh, they need to be hospitalized or some people lost their lives. So these kind of incidences were uh, were important and therefore uh, they, they kind of, a, they, 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 the scope of discussion on chemical industrial disaster management has uh, grown over the years and now a number of factors have been included. For example, now we are also considering the impact of a chemical disaster direct and indirect. So it can affect the human beings directly or other animals and plants directly, but it can also affect the human beings and other uh, life forms uh, through, the, through the, the, the route of affecting our geological, uh, uh, geological systems, including soil and water systems, natural resources, atmosphere. And so, so that uh, route is also there. And, it can also lead damage to property by by way of uh, uh, if explosions are there, uh, so so it can it can uh, it can cause damage to damage to property, buildings, and machinery also. Uh, but it is very interesting that uh, many of times we we talk as uh, for of emergency response as if uh, that is the only important thing. But uh, in in fact, uh, when we uh, when we discuss about industrial uh, chemical disaster risk management. Then emergency preparedness is actually the last or the third layer of uh, the defense mechanism. Uh, the first is that uh, we avoid and we reduce the risk of any kind of a trigger mechanism. Then second is that if if the trigger takes place or if the incident is there, so so uh, that, that we say that how how we contain the incident. So how we contain the incident so that it does not convert into a, a significant accident. So that is that is the important uh, dimension that has been added recently. Uh, this is also a, a kind of a, a lesson from experiences not only uh, 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 in European countries, but India's experience has also been very significant because India is the land uh, where, where the industry, the worst industrial uh, accident of human history has taken place, that is Bhopal. So, so there also we realize that uh, even the land use is a very important aspect and environmental settings that includes the, ge the eco geophysiographical -physio dimensions. So that is very important whether we, we, we are using any kind of a runoff model or the, the liquid discharge model, a model or the, 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 the release of the obnoxious gases uh, forming the vapor, uh, vapor cloud or uh, causing explosion or the, the vapor cloud explosion, these kind of scenarios that we, uh, uh, that we use uh, when we, when we uh, do, do our risk assessment, uh, particularly the physical effect modeling. So, so land characteristics is always very important. And when we say land, it also takes care of the surface roughness parameters, including the buildings. So, so uh, the, the concept of uh, uh, the kind of a, uh, that uh, the, the safety or the disaster risk management has to start from uh, the industrial siting criteria itself. So, so that is, that is the kind of important lesson. So we start from site risk assessment, then hazard risk assessment, then looking into uh, the multi-hazard assessment because natural and man-made uh, uh, factors can, can interact with each other and can uh, lead to the complex emergency. And that is why we have put in this terminology called maximum credible accident, accident scenarios and consequence assessment because 
physical effect is the first layer effect but how the physical effect affects the the vulnerable people vulnerable uh, land use or the, the property and, uh, and and whatever machinery is there so so and that actually determines the final consequence of an accident so that final consequent assessment is also very important in order to uh, to prudently develop emergency plans and then the, the entire cycle entire all the stages of emergency uh, management so this is very important dimension that has uh, in fact expanded the scope of disaster risk management uh, this is just a glimpse of the national the, the, uh, the national discourse that we had uh, with industry and uh, academia and a number of experts were there from across, all across the country uh, for developing national action plan on chemical disaster management jointly with ministry of environment forest and here if we see that uh, what i was discussing about the land use so so identification uh, of suitable sites for industrial locations or suitable sites for the, uh, the for waste disposal kind of thing particularly hazardous waste now even electronic waste is also processing of electronic waste is also coming up very very important dimension then new new human settlements why these kind of things are important because land is now becoming the most limiting factor there was a time when we used to talk that water is the most limiting factor our, our air is going to be a serious issue yes air is a serious issue as we have been witnessing uh, the air pollution episodes also but i would say that uh, 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 at large land is the real limiting factor because all the developmental settings are going to be located on the land and that is the real crisis and and uh, uh, this crisis leads to 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 land use conflicts and uh, whenever in industry is uh, allowed to 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 uh, establish uh, we sometimes are not able to enforce two way land use controls uh, whereas i say that if the industry is allowed to to establish uh the, initially industry should not be allowed in the human habitat area yes there are regulations and proper care is taken for uh, the, the industrial siting but many of the incidences we have seen including the jaipur fire and this recent visakhapatnam incident also uh, that uh, when the industry was given site it was uh, no population zone or no habitat zone but uh, gradually uh, a, a number of people start coming and getting settled down down nearby the industry and then those temporary colonies convert into the permanent housing uh, and permanent uh, infrastructure and that actually leads to land use conflicts so how to address these things that that also need to be taken care of, particularly when we are developing the disaster management plan for the government side also because uh, we need to we need to look at that how we are going to address these issues then there are two important aspects of industrial chemical accident uh, risk management uh, one is the process logical control and technological dimension but on the other hand the personal and behavioral dimensions because uh, within the within the risk assessment uh, process we have two 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 uh, uh, methods one is the hazard that is hazard analysis there we use the dow and mon index kind of thing so so we analyze that how uh, the the uh, the material uh, the and, and the inventory based on these uh, what is the hazard potential how uh, what can be the physical effect scenario but how the physical effect scenario will get a trigger so uh, are, are how the uh, the failure uh, failure incident will take place there uh, real human human mistakes are human behavioral dimensions play a great role and that is why the hazard is very important exercise uh, that is hazard and operability analysis so operability is basically how you operate so whether you operate mechanically how you operate uh, the, uh, through the logical systems are uh, are through 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 automation but uh, uh, always there are human angle involved so that is very important dimension we cannot ignore beside this uh, this is this is also an important uh, lesson uh, uh, based on the analysis of number of accidents over over past two or three decades uh, that uh, many times we find that ma any major incident or many ex major accident uh, give some kind of a early warning or uh, there were all uh, always some kind of a signal some kind of a alert signals including bhopal disaster also before bhopal say before, a few months before bhopal disaster there was a death because of uh, be, be, uh, be, be, because of uh, the, the exposure to 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 uh, fast gene gas and and uh, in in kolkata kolkata uh, bridge collapse kolkata flyover collapse also we see or any other kind of industrial mishap also we see that there are small small incidences but sometimes we we tend to ignore these 
so so the lesson is that if we if we do not ignore these uh, we we will get get uh, effective effective signals that something is going to be wrong and something going going in wrong direction and and that is why i say uh, that uh, the accident reporting system is very very important aspect of industrial chemical disaster management and here in fact misses and near misses are also equally important and those should be analyzed uh, with, with using the mechanism of the accident analysis are the are the are the, in, the forensic investigations of in the of the uh, the incidences so so that gives an, a good insight to to foolproof our uh, industrial and process safety systems uh, then this is a generic kind of understanding that how we understand disasters and uh, risk is uh, basically an indicative of the probability so it is not sure that that scenario is going to take place because it depends a number of other factors but 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 there is a difference between natural disaster and uh, industrial chemical disaster because industrial chemical disaster uh, most of the things are human uh, are under human control and therefore the concept of zero tolerance can be applicable in in the in the uh, management of chemical uh, technical industrial and chemical disasters so these are the kind of things then then why risk assessment or risk analysis is important because uh, uh, any kind of a, a, a alert or forewarning or forecasting uh, can help us uh, 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 manage uh, the risk in a way that the unwanted situations can be avoided. And if cannot be avoided fully, the size of the incident can be reduced to 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 the great extent so that uh, the, the incident can be contained without uh, allowing it to cause the major damage. So that is important. Uh, then also, if something happens, what can be the damage potential? What can be the consequence? and then take decisions to control systems for example uh, whenever any kind of incident takes place so what is the safe shutdown procedure that is always very very important that safe shutdown procedure uh, uh, and then uh, evaluating the effectiveness of the control measures so that we can also have the technical improvements then this is this is a general layout of the technical risk assessment emergency planning steps so so uh, uh, we 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 uh, kind of a, uh, we cut down the, the entire plant or entire uh, industry into various uh, uh, maybe based on the plants or the location wise so that because each and every each, each and every uh, segment of industry has its own uh, different set of uh, hazards and different set of vulnerability the vulnerabilities can also vary particularly the human exposure can also vary by the shift for example night shift there will be lesser people as compared to the day shifts so, so all those things have to be taken into consideration when we are moving towards a quantitative risk assessment. Quantitative risk assessment gives us a more characterization, detailed characterization of the risk, and and they they are actually uh, we 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 move to the probabilistic risk assessment by combining the what if analysis kind of thing, and and then it leads to on-site and off-site emergency. So these are more detailed detailed uh, uh, account as I already discussed about the fault tree analysis and. The event tree analysis, fault tree analysis is in the forensic investigation that uh, uh, that if something has already happened, so how we go back? Uh, for example, what we do in uh, what we do in, uh, in 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 our forensic investigation. Many of you might have seen that uh, CID, CID, and uh, other kind of a uh, investigative serials and movies. So so uh, when when something has already taken place, we go back and try to find out. The real culprit are trying to find out the real scenario which are the, the event the trigger event that has been responsible so that uh, we can improve the situation for the future but on the other hand the event tree uh, that that builds upon that if something happens what will happen then if the, if it happens what will happen so 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 that kind of a alternative uh, uh, routes are identified and then we built upon and create uh, the possible scenarios uh, this is about uh, just a, a glimpse of the fault tree analysis that if something happens that there are two two possibilities then uh, if if uh, the release of chemical through uh, relief valve takes place then what are the what are the possible scenarios so it is like this then risk estimation uh, that, that this is very important because we we talk of uh, the acceptance criteria so particularly uh, in order to understand that what is what is the risk whether it is under the acceptable criteria or uh, are not acceptable because the purpose is uh, the, there is a terminology that is called alarm as low as reasonably practical the alarm principle applies here is risk, risk acceptable if it is not acceptable then we have to work to bring it down to the acceptable level because risk cannot be brought to zero we always have to work with risk we always have to live with risk but risk has to be brought to acceptable 
zone. So that that is the that is the LR principle. And and there are a number of models. Particularly now we are we are using a blended approach because now uh, we are trying to plot the risk and the the hazard scenarios and the the, the consequences on on the on the geological maps or on the land use map so that we can understand uh, that if something if a uh, uh, the uh, vapor cloud explosion takes place uh, which direction the impact will be there if the if the explosion occurs then uh, to what extent the window uh, the glass window can be broken to what extent there will be heat waves and then to what extent there will be shock waves so for example then we also can understand that to, uh, the people exposed to this whether they will have a burn injury or they will have other kind of injuries or only other kind of shocks. So these are very important dimensions for risk assessment. And as I already referred that a human factor is very, very important. And, and uh, that is why uh, we are giving emphasis on uh, trainings also, uh, because uh, uh, if we look at, if we look at the analysis of the past disasters, uh, it is uh, rarely uh, found that uh, the, the, uh, the mistakes of the particular people have been identified. Many a times that the, 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 uh, the assessment and reports of the, the incidences uh, end up finding the fault with the technical uh, components. But uh, anybody would, uh, would agree with me that the technical, the failure of the technical uh, the components will also be the responsibility of sub certain operators or the managers or the supervisors or the suppliers. So, so in order to improve the, the risk management system, we also look at, need to look at the human mistakes uh, uh, very, very uh, uh, correctly, so that uh, so that uh, we can address the capacity gaps or knowledge gaps, or uh, if there are some kind of flaws in the manuals or uh, any kind of trainings or calcula, uh, curricula, so that can be addressed. Uh, as as uh, many of the engineers who are attending here, they would uh, agree with me. That when uh, when you have done your BE or BTEC five years or four years, uh, uh, you are never taught about the reliability uh, risk analysis or the safety assessment or safety analysis or industrial safety, chemical safety, process safety kind of thing. But when you join the industry, some of you are asked to look after the safety. So so now we have been talking with with the AICT also, and many of the IITs and NITs have also already included. The reliability engineering and safety uh, dimensions disaster management uh, in their curricula and AICT has also already issued a model curriculum on disaster management so that is very important so that our engineers have uh, the, the basic understanding and knowledge now this is about the various kind of risk assessment so so many times we we so we think that risk assessment is only one thing one type but uh, looking at the type of industry uh, there, there may be a number of uh, risk assessment uh, mechanisms or methods that can be employed. For example, in a, in a power plant, even the ecological risk assessment may, may be required, or health risk assessment may also be required, uh, particularly the pharma industry and fertilizer industry where a lot of chemicals are there. So, so uh, it depends. Then, then uh, uh, process industry, certainly safety risk assessment is there. Then uh, environmental risk assessment, health risk assessment, public welfare risk assessment, like uh, how how uh, in this have uh, impact your uh, corporate social responsibility initiative so that can also be taken care uh, then then ecological financial risk also like like many times uh, a major disruption or major industry industrial disaster can also lead to the disruption in supply chain and can also impact the market to a significant level and the, even even the impact can be long lasting and then socio cultural risk also so that can also be possible then, then uh, risk assessment is a kind of a decision making or decision support system that is important. So, so it also follows that the common research methodology regime that uh, identifying the problem and then carrying out the risk assessment like hijab and uh, particularly this is about the, the, the pharmaceutical units kind of thing. So this was included uh, looking to the incident that took place in Vishakhapatnam. Uh, like like uh, what what is the dose or what is the exposure and then how it causes uh, the impairment uh, health impairment or are the kind of a lethal level this is just a listing of a number of uh, uh, mathematical models that are available for physical effect modeling like vejan we have been using for uh, that, that is the world bank support model that we were using for uh, for for uh, uh, physical effect modeling then then there is a simtox then fit model is there uh, fire explosion toxicity uh, index then uh, this so there, there are a number of models which are available Vajana I already discussed effects model is 
are there basically based on based on the uh, the kind of a material and based on the based on the wind pattern and softness right uh, criteria it it uh, uh, gives us uh, the scenario possible scen uh, alternative scenarios then uh, now uh, the models like uh, uh, KMU and uh, Aloha KMU and Aloha the model that use your uh, kind of a uh, web enabled GIS uh, support systems so we can plot it uh, plot the risk on the map. So these kind of uh, a number of uh, medical models are available. Uh, in in case of uh, the the air dis air dispersion or the atmospheric scenario, the Gaussian is the one of the common principle that has been applied. So so uh, now uh, technically we have lot of opportunities. Lot of uh, scope is there for improving our uh, uh, risk assessment process in India. But there are certain limitations. Uh, and the limitation is that that is still we are using the British uh, accident uh, and failure data. Uh, now, uh, when we have Make in India program and, and, and uh, a highly diversified chemical and uh, chemical industry in the country, uh, it is it is high time that we we start developing our own uh, accident data and failure data in the country. And then uh, the, the the international models which are available need to be need to be uh, customized to the indian requirement their weather condition indian terrain conditions these kind of things are also important then then uh, as adaptability to conditions so this is also important and and we need to look at the inherent limitations of these models so so we need to also have the alternative approaches uh, that that also can be a participatory approach uh, because many a times that the, the community knowledge and community based information or the participatory information can also help improve the risk assessment process. Uh, this is about improving improving the emergency response and and the resilience uh, yeah, within industrial settings or industrial estates and industrial parks. That how how uh, various uh, various subset facilities or various infrastructure systems are depending on each other, and that sometimes uh, causes causes major major failure. So that uh, may may cause a kind of a chain reaction. For example, the electricity. Uh, uh, can can determine the, uh, the, the sustainability or failure of the the hospital system or the heating requirement or cooling requirement or the transport system. So these kind of things are also uh, important. Now this is a new dimension, but very important and globally acceptable. Accepted that now a risk management need not to be looked uh, uh, in isolation from resilience and sustainability because. Risk management is about managing a particular incident. So it says that uh, known knowns. And also to to extend that note known unknowns because uh, we know the kind of scenario, but possibility or the probability we do not know when it will occur. So this is this is one thing about known knowns and known unknowns. But now now we are required to move ahead that how we uh, make uh, flexibility of our systems. We develop redundancy also flexibility also so that they they they, they our operate, operate, operation systems and management systems uh, adjust to to the changing scenarios. So that is important particularly. Uh, this kind of experience has emerged uh, like the coronavirus pandemic period also when when we ask that uh, the industry will operate with 50 percent of the staff or 30 percent of the staff so how how we adjust with your uh, management mechanisms how you adjust with your technical uh, 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 manuals or technical uh, technical operations so 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 with the changing scenario so that is also important and then how how the how how the uh, the business continuity management uh, will integrate uh, the issues related with environmental emergencies like uh, the uh, uh, Rua was also referring to black swan event event and and uh, like the coronavirus incident is you know, considered as a black black swan event is because black swan event is something which is which is a high intensity in fact but uh, the frequency is least or very very less uh, in the other other words we, we call it a kind of a maximum critical accident where the probability is least, but is still believed to be probable, and if something happens, it is it is of catastrophic nature. And then uh, we need not to look at the industrial chemical safety or disaster management only for the present generation. So uh, because because any major industry or any major corporate sector or any major developmental uh, setting is not only for 10 years, 15 years, or 30 years time. So new set of managers uh, come and replace the old ones. New set of engineers will come and will replace the old ones. Uh, like what happens our generations. So similarly, the intragenerational uh, safety issues, how we are going to address uh, the, the, the facilitation of the safety and safety management by the future generation of the engineers, future generation of the industry managers. 
so when we when we integrate this risk management resilience and uh, sustainability then it provides it kind of a, 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 a overall picture of a disaster resilience and disaster risk management within a industry now now i am i am advocating very loudly uh, and uh, i am allowed to say this uh, that uh, uh, all the all the industries and particularly at the business uh, house level are all the industry uh, unit level so so i say that the business disaster management is a new new kind of a terminology that we have evolved that all businesses need to prepare disaster management plan uh, they 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 foresee that what can happen so what can go wrong what can happen if something happens that what will be the consequence what will be the scenario and how how you need to to put uh, put your risk preparedness in place and how you you can uh, coordinate for uh, reducing the risk reducing the impact of this that kind of a unforeseen uh, unexpected incident so that is very important then then i already discussed that the business continuity regime need to integrate environmental emergencies for example recently we we faced the the severe level of air pollution so how this health emergency are these kind of things are also emerging as a new challenge and how businesses are going to integrate that then then water emergencies for example the sudden contamination of water bodies uh, so how we are going to address these kind of things then conflicts then other natural factors oil spill e waste hazardous waste these kind of things are emerging as a kind of a new dimension the ultimate objective or ultimate kind of a uh, one liner uh, for for, uh, for uh, from from a senior uh, top management point of view uh, for looking at safety and industry in uh, safety and disaster management within industry that i do not want any surprises uh, it means that uh, you you try to un understand and you try to identify you try to analyze all possible scenarios and then we can identify the mcas and then our uh, most important uh, scenarios and so that we are we are prepared more efficiently so that is very important and these are some of the publications from an idm side on various dimensions of industrial chemical disaster management like how environmental legislation plays role how gis can play a role on managing industrial chemical disaster management so so uh, you, these can be freely downloaded uh, downloaded from the website of an idm and i have also shared in the chat box my research gate address all my publications can be can be can be downloaded from my research gate address and uh, freely uh, in the pdf form so with this uh, it is very important that we give impetus to the capacity building initiatives in disaster management uh, within industry and that should be not only a particular are the limited number of people or limited number of employees but all the all all the all the sections so so we can say that the top management middle management and lower and shop floor workers all and even the contract workers so that is also important that uh, they they are giving adequate safety training and that safety when i say safety training or safety uh, people say safety first many of the times we we say that uh, safety uh, safety should be our priority i i say that uh, mind safety so mind safety basically we, sh we it should be it, it should be our thinking thinking that the top of our thinking that whenever we think of any kind of a individual any kind of intervention we should think of safety whether we are traveling anywhere whether we are constructing anywhere we are erecting something whether we are installing a new machine uh, if we recall the the, the uh, oxygen plant explosion in visakhapatnam in 2013 then then uh, uh, some of you uh, who who must be knowing that kind of incident so uh, uh, how how the the curiosity or how how the, the over uh, enthusiasm can also lead to lead to these kind of things so uh, both technical as well as human management both comprise the important dimensions of chemical industrial disaster risk management regime so with this introduction introductory uh, uh, talk uh, I, i hope that this training program is going to be a uh, very important contribution in, in this uh, uh, direction thank you very much and over to over to uh, uh, mr ruab and mrs sanjeev yeah, ruab thank you so much uh, uh, professor anil gupta ji thank you uh, for your very detailed uh, uh this lecture and, and there is a reason uh, i would like to share with all the participants who are over 400 in number now there's a reason we we have this lead lecture and, uh, and it is it this can be uh, made by none other than uh, professor gupta who spent uh, uh, you know decades together uh, uh, professional career um, in, in in developing uh, uh, you know uh, <coughs> such important uh, national uh, Uh, not only guidelines but also framework uh, and he is advising uh, and been uh, 
uh, key source of uh, knowledge for many industries and industrial bodies and regulators in the country. And uh, we really thank you, uh, uh, Dr. For, for your uh, uh, for very uh, enlightening presentation. I think it sets uh, in the right uh, uh, sense of the word, it sets the perspective to the coming three days of what the participants should expect and must expect that they would learn. Uh, I'm sure it has triggered a lot of interesting uh, 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 discussions and arguments in the minds of the participants and the listeners. And I encourage them if they have any question uh, uh, which they would like to ask uh, uh, Professor Gupta uh, or uh, to uh, uh, Shri Madan Mohanji, who is our next speaker, please feel free to ask those questions, type those questions in the question and answer window. After the presentation of uh, Mr. Mohan, we would take those questions up uh, and, and I'll, I'll, we'll facilitate answers from the experts directly. Uh, I think for Professor Gupta, very, uh, you know, in his detailed uh, presentation, touched upon very critical aspects, uh, which, which, which may sound very, you know, uh, uh, in a form of commonsensical to a lot of people, but sometimes why this has been reinforced and uh, uh, re-emphasized is because they are ignored at times, which can lead to, uh, you know, catastrophes, uh, you know, of, of proportions which uh, in a country like India do not need any reminder because, you know, we, we, the, the largest and the biggest industrial disaster, as uh, Professor Gupta mentioned, was the Bhopal gas tragedy. And I think uh, it is expected out of uh, us that we uh, take this subject all the more seriously because the largest accident happened in a country like ours. And uh, we, we, we are uh, fast growing into, be, into, into becoming one of the most industrialized countries in the world. In fact, the industrial 4.0, when we talk about that, uh, you know, Germany is taking a lead in that, but India has been taken more seriously than ever before in formulating the entire scope of uh, uh, work and, uh, you know, uh, in detailing the industrialization, industry 4.0, uh, guidelines and uh, framework and I think uh, it is a, as I said it is uh, it could not have been a better moment for us to talk on the subject because uh, uh, from a commercial point of view nobody would want to do and I'm sure uh, uh, Professor Gupta and Mr. Mohan will agree with me that nobody wants to do business with corporations that risk the quality of the product and the safety of their employees. It, it goes hand in hand to increase the bottom line. If somebody would compromise with the safety of their employees, it will have maybe bigger impact uh, than the quality of the product would have on, on the business of a corporation. Companies who care about their employees put them first. And when that happens, productivity increases. That's the formula. Suddenly, the employees uh, is no longer just a number, but a person who can actually make a difference. And that is a culture which we want to, we, we, are, we are willing to promote. And that, and that is the reason, uh, Professor Gupta, I think uh, uh, the fan club, your fan club is developing in thousands now. Uh, in last uh, seven, eight months, I'm sure, with whatever push or whatever outreach we could uh, uh, ensure as, as CIDM at FIKI, with, with great support of, of uh, you know, the backbone, I call them, you know, the Akhil Gupta, Sanjeev, um, uh, Menak Mojumdar, Varun Sharma, and your Harshit and Anjali from 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 NIDM. I think we've been able to create a a dhacha bandya, sir. You know, this is something, uh, and and the expectations are high. So you can imagine in four OTPs, 400 se upar hamesha delegates hai, and this is uh, really overwhelming because uh, with fourth or fifth, we would have thought the numbers will come down. But every OTP, we are in between around the 500 to 400 to 500 mark. And I think this is a great, uh, I know the quality is super. The, the, the content, this is a testimony that the content which is being brought together or being compiled is, is great quality. But um, I, as you always say, Professor Gupta, that the, uh, the, uh, the biggest compliments and uh, appreciation for the team, which has made sure that these participants have a platform which is seamless, which is, uh, you know, technically sound, where they can gain the most.
So thank you again, Professor Gupta, for your very enlightening speech. Thank you so much. Um, ladies and gentlemen, now uh, moving on to the next uh, speaker. Uh, and he's a great professional, uh, a, a very known uh, personality in the oil and gas business and also when it comes to industrial safety, then almost across all um, uh, sectors, Mr. Madan Mohan um, you know, is, a, is a known personality. He's the DGM of project execution at uh, Gale India. Uh, a brief introduction of uh, Sri Madan Mohan. Uh, he's a graduate in mechanical engineering from HBTI Kanpur and MBA in marketing from Agra University. He has experience of 18 long years in ONM of natural gas pipelines and compressor stations, project execution of cross country natural gas pipelines. He holds NACE CIP level one certificate, ILI masterclass certificate by ASME, certified energy auditor from BEE. He is IPMA level C certified project management professional as well. Presently, he is working with corporate project execution group at NOIDA at Gale involved in project execution of cross-country natural gas pipelines. So uh, uh, on that note, uh, uh, Mr. Madan Mohan, over to you. And for all the participants, for your interest, you, I, I'm sure a lot of us are aware that natural gas pipeline is perhaps, uh, in India, uh, is perhaps one of the fastest growing uh, uh, sector uh, uh, across any industrial sector, if you may say. Uh, you know, this is the fastest growing network and uh, it has been something which is closely been watched by the, uh, the, the, the global giants also who have, uh, you know, in, in developed and developing countries that the, 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 the work which we are doing in India and Gale is the leader of, 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 of this uh, entire uh, network. I think uh, my congratulations and compliments to Gale and uh, to Madan Mohanji to use as well for the great work which has been executed under um, the flagship, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the Navratna company, Gale. Uh, we are really proud of the work you're doing and we look forward to your presentation on safety through pipelines, pipeline integrity management. Over to you. Thank you, Mr. Rwalsu. Thank you for this wonderful uh, introduction. And uh, I would like to thank you, uh, Dr. Anil Kumar Gupta, head NIDM, General Bharadwaj, Team from Fiki comprising of Mr. Akhil, Mr. Sanjeev, Mr. Mainak Majumdar, and dear participants. A very good afternoon to you all, and I'm grateful to you all for giving me this opportunity to put forward my views on uh, safety management of natural gas, cross country natural gas pipelines. I hope my uh, voice is audible. Yeah. Just uh, first of all, I would like to take you through Gale's uh, portfolio in our country. As uh, Mr. Rubab already mentioned, uh, we are the largest uh, pipeline operators in country. We are operating around 12,000 kilometers of natural gas pipelines in, with around uh, 2,000 kilometers of LPG pipelines running across the length and breadth of the country. Also, we are having around uh, 1.4 million metric tons per annum capacity of liquid hydrocarbon production that is LPG, naphtha, propane, pentane, and other value-added products. They are derived from natural gas only. We are also having participation in exploration and production blocks in, in India as well as uh, in offshore countries also. And uh, we are committed to promoting clean and green energy through operation of several city gas distribution networks, CNG stations, which are through our joint venture companies and uh, wholly owned subsidiary Gale Gas Limited. We are also having uh, participation in uh, this RGPPL, Ritnagiri Power Plant, which is a power plant based on natural, uh, liquefied natural gas. Further, if we look at the pipeline scenario in, in India, you can see we are currently at around 17,000 kilometers of natural gas pipeline in which Gale share is maximum around at uh, 12,000 kilometers presently we are operating. And in next three to four years, we are already going to add around 7,000 kilometers of pipeline to our network. Combined with this, other operators also will be having a capacity of around 33,000 kilometers of pipeline, natural gas pipeline in our country in next three to four years. 
Uh, similarly, this crude oil and other petroleum products pipeline we are around uh, at around 28,000 kilometers. So this is a huge network, uh, which is spread across uh, length and breadth of our country, as you can see in this map. So this itself poses a lot of challenge. How can we be safe while we operate the pipelines, we transport the gas, or we transport the petroleum products? They are highly, uh, for safety point of view, they are highly dangerous. But, uh, but uh, if we follow the safe procedure practices, we can mitigate the risk. As uh, Dr. Gupta earlier pointed out, the first line of defense, the first line of defense is the management of safety, the management of integrity. Why, why this integrity management is important as we talk about pipeline or any other assets? There are a few very basic things like uh, management of threats and prevent, uh, prevention of failures. Safety of people and surroundings, environment. We have to comply with the regulations. We have to optimize the expenditure as well as optimize the risk to the business due to any mishappening or catastrophic event. If we look at the data that is gathered over the period of time, we can see the maximum number of uh, accident or incident in pipeline happens because of third party damages or encroachment. Coupled with that, uh, there are several factors like internal corrosion or external corrosion or natural causes or uh, follow, uh, not following purpose operation and pro uh, maintenance procedures. But uh, this encroachment remains number one. As already pointed out by Dr. Gupta, that uh, when, when we lay a pipeline or we install or commission a plant, it is away from population area. But over the period of time, the population uh, around the plant or pipeline, it increases and it changes the land use. So there are several land use conflicts and that's a major challenge for any pipeline operator or any process plant operating in the country or worldwide. So how, how do we overcome the challenges to natural gas uh, pipeline safety or integrity? We have to have a systematic approach towards management of integrity. This integrity management program provides uh, means to extend the safety of the system. Any integrity management plan, a very good integrity management plan uh, definitely has elements like management plan, the performance metrics, the communication plan, management of change, and quality control. It's all as per ASME B31.8S. If you look at the flow chart, the first step is, uh, first of all, we have to gather as many data as possible. Then we analyze them, we review them, and we assess the risk. That is critical risk assessment. Then based on that risk assessment, we assess the integrity of our system or our pipeline. Based on that assessment, outcome of that assessment, we prepare our response and mitigation measures. Then again, it is put into performance metrics to determine its effectiveness and for future corrective actions. Now, there are several threats to pipeline integrity. The first, with the very first step is to identify what are those risks. What are those conditions which can increase the risk to my pipeline or any asset? Any root cause, it is, it is labeled as threat to the pipeline or asset integrity. And uh, as pipeliners, we identify the threats or risks on segment basis. Although we are operating the pipelines in the entire length and breadth of the country, we cannot go at one stage for all the pipeline network. We segment, we do it segment wise. For analysis of risk, uh, we rely on well-known practices like knowledge-based or experience-based risk assessment scenario-based risk assessment, relative risk models, probabilistic models, like uh, you all be aware about risk probability matrix, that is uh, probability and occurrences, probability of occurrences and consequences of those occurrences. We uh, get a mathematical number and we put uh, across a table like this. The darker the color, the more risk is there. For any pipeline, uh, we can classify the threats like 
time dependent which are there as we operate the pipelines dependent on times and then uh, we can categorize them as stable threats the threats the threats that, that are already known when we are constructing a pipeline or installing an asset we already know what can go wrong like uh, in pipeline welding or during coating process during installation of any equipment what type of things can go wrong we already identify them and we try to minimize those defects then there are uh, defects due to third party encroachments damages or incorrect operations or other natural causes like uh, lightning or floods or earthquakes there are few uh, these are few examples of time dependent threats like corrosion corrosion is a uh, number one enemy of any pipeline asset be it internal corrosion or external corrosion or corrosion due to stress existing in the pipeline material there are stable threats like uh, welding defect or manufacturing defect in the pipeline material then there are time independent threats like this can happen uh, any point of time if you are not proper about supervision or surveillance of our assets that can be done through mechanical damage by third party or any other natural causes as per asme b31.8 s it uh, guides us about what methods we can use for integrity management of our, uh, management of our pipelines based on the priorities which we determine through risk assessment we have several methods like inline inspection that is we insert a uh, intelligent tool in the pipeline which flows along with the fluid and it inspects and captures the relevant data for us for further analysis and establishing the health condition of the pipeline then there is uh, another method of pressure testing then direct assessment where any inline inspection or other technique is not used then we use direct assessment we'll talk it uh, talk about it later see this uh, pipeline integrity management process it's a continuous process it starts with the during the concept and commissioning stage then it is transferred to the operation stage then it is continued till the pipeline or asset is in operation and it ends with amendment of that assets so during the life cycle of the any pipeline or any asset we have to have inspection monitoring mechanism integrity assessment methods and techniques then based on that assessment techniques we have to have a mitigation and repair plans during design and construction that is to avoid the stable or known threats there are several techniques as well as there are several techniques during the operation and maintenance phase like during the design and construction of any pipeline we can have sound design principles we are uh, constructing our pipeline as per the international standard that is asme or ansi standards we are using we are using latest technologies be it related to uh, pipeline material or welding techniques or coating techniques or inspection methodologies we are uh, suitable uh, this uh, selection of material for pipeline we are using carbon steel uh, mostly but uh, depending on the situation if we have to lay our pipeline for corrosive substance use we can go for additives and we can have superior metal properties like uh, alloy steels we can have polyethylene coating we can have reliable cathodic protection system that is to safeguard the pipeline against the damages from external corrosion as well as to some extent from internal corrosion we can have the selection of pipeline wall thickness as per the population density that is again driven through international guidance document like asme b31.8 this corrosion resistance alloys normally we use during uh, transportation of very toxic fluids through the pipeline normally in natural gas we do not encounter such type of problems but at times like in uh, crude oil pipelines we have this kind of problem where we have to rely on this corrosion resistance alloy additional precautions like uh, we can have uh, corrosion allowance inbuilt in the pipeline thickness Wh whatever is required as per the formula pd by 2t we add certain uh, say 1 mm or 2 mm to that thickness as corrosion allowance 
minimum ground cover of one meter is provided as per guidelines. All the radiograph, all the uh, welding joints, they are hundred percent inspected through radiography methods. We carry out hydro testing of pipelines before we commission them, before we put in the gas in the system. That is, whatever is the design pressure, we take 1.5 times to that design pressure. We hydro test the pipeline, then we use it. All the pipelines are 100% internally inspected before they are put into the service. So that we can have a baselining data that this is the condition of my pipeline before we started the operation. And for a period of time, going through various techniques, we can compare or assess the internal conditions of the pipeline. During the ONM phase, we have several assessment tools for integrity like in-line inspection. We have several type of tools like caliper pigging tool, which captures the geometry of the pipeline, whether it is uh, having some mechanical damage, which is not visible to us since it is underground. We have corrosion detection tool, which can detect and size the corrosion, extent of corrosion and its location. Based on that, we can plan our mitigative action. Axial fraud detection tool, XYZ mapping tools, they are all somewhat similar type of tools. Then we have cathodic protection monitoring where there are several component to this system like uh, cathodic protection power supply module or transfer re transformer rectifier units. We closely monitor them, we take their readings and we analyze them and we, we put into our uh, prior experience based on that, we infer what is the condition of pipeline. Then on of PSP surveys, like pipeline is going through uh, remote areas, deserted areas, as well as populated areas, but we carry out this PSP survey just to assess the, whether my coating condition or health of the pipeline is safe or not. Then uh, several other methods like anode bed resistance monitoring, CPL DCVG, direct current voltage gradient, like uh, this is used for assessing the condition of coating. This pipeline coating that is three layer pipeline, uh, three layer polyethylene coating. This is the first line of defense of any pipeline for protection against corrosion, be it external or internal. This uh, direct current voltage gradient, it uh, shows us whether there is any defect existing in the coating. If uh, at any place, if coating is peeled off due to any reason, mechanical or man-made, we can get to know without digging the pipeline. We can get to know where the problem might be and there we can go and uh, intervene. Then surveillance like uh, patrolling on food patrolling or through air surveillance or through electronic media like uh, we are uh, installing CCTV cameras across all our uh, SV stations or IP stations or compressor stations just to know whether all the things are under control and no surprises are uh, encountered in day-to-day -day operations. Hydro testing we already talked about then direct assessment and evaluation like external corrosion direct assessment and internal corrosion direct assessment. These are assessment techniques which normally where we do not uh, employ the earlier testing method like inline inspection where we cannot insert a tool into the pipeline. We rely on this ECDA or ICDA or direct, direct assessment we can say. Then thickness assessment is a proven technique where for all the installation where pipeline is coming above ground, we monitor the thickness through ultrasonic probes and we compare it with historical data to know the condition of our assets. There are a few examples of uh, surveillance using helicopter or food patrolling. The importance of surveillance is to know whether my pipeline having some vulnerable high consequence area or vulnerable location like uh, near the river banks near the road crossings or near the nalas or canals or where any type of landslides or flooding can happen. We carry out uh, once in two months the survey through helicopters and annually we carry out the patrolling through walking on foot over the entire length of the pipeline. There are several standards like uh, OISD and PNGRB guidelines, which specify what type of frequency we should adopt while we are patrolling the pipeline on foot. In class location three and four, which are mostly urbanized areas, if we have any pipeline near these class locations, we carry out daily patrolling 
although the guideline says we have to uh, carry out the patrolling only once in a month we are carrying it out on a daily basis through our contact manpower these are some pictures taken while uh, carrying out food patrolling or survey of rou then there are cases like we have to cross already existing pipeline and there has to be abundant precaution taken while we are laying a pipeline or doing any maintenance like bonding of uh, cp this is very important so that there is least interference because of other pipelines catalytic protection system then another important aspect is gas quality monitoring this natural gas pipeline see we are very careful about what we are putting into our pipeline we have to transport it thousands of kilometers from one place to another place we simply cannot afford to bypass this quality aspect if you are allowing any type of impurities like uh, h2s gases or co2 gases or moisture into the pipeline they can cause chemical reaction and uh, they can lead to production of acids which are detrimental to the steel of the pipeline so we are installing gas dryers or gas sweating units for uh, reading the gas of moisture or toxic gases like h2s h2s and co2 basically we have several gas analyzers like h2s analyzer or moisture analyzer or gas chromatograph where we can get to know what is the composition of gas we are going to put in our pipeline so that based on the readings and based on the standards we can stop it or take the preventive measures sometime uh, we have to despite all these precautions we, we have to have chemical treatment just to avoid any ill consequences of the product uh, which is not conforming to our quality requirement it is entering in the pipeline we have to manage because huge volume of gas flowing through the gas pipeline and any impurity whether it is in ppms that can accumulate over a time and cause trouble for us so we have to rely on chemical treatments like we inhibit corrosion inhibitors in the pipeline we inject corrosion inhibitors we inject biocides which avoids the formation of bacteria yeah, <laughs> that's a funny concept but uh, we do encounter some type of biocides induced corrosion internal corrosion in the pipelines we control the hydrate formation with the help of methanol this uh, chemical treatment depends on several factors like what is the rate of corrosion in our pipeline what is the severity and what is exactly the root cause of the problem what type of element which is entering our gas pipelines which is causing problem this corrosion inhibitor application it has to follow a proper set procedure we have to rely on third parties testing to verify what type of in, uh, dosing we are doing we have to have a proper documentation of what uh, quantity and at what time it was injected then biocide selection it has to follow a protocol as defined by nase that is a international body on corrosion control these are apparatus for inhibiting injecting corrosion inhibitors in corrosion monitoring of pipeline we have to attack it in two direction one is prevention from external corrosion that is taken care through proper coating of the pipeline as well as having cathodic protection and second is internal corrosion for cathodic protection there are several uh, elements in that like cp psm monitoring psp monitoring all these frequencies how and what frequency we have to monitor them that is defined by international standard as well as our very own standard recommended by osd and pngrb sorry then uh, we carry out correct cathodic protection surveys which includes on off psv surveys or closed interval potential logging we carry out the on off psp survey and we plot it using a software and we get to know some inference about the health of the pipeline 
Red current voltage gradient, it again talks about how is the my how is the condition of my coating over the pipeline. Then based on these uh, assessment, we carry out the mitigation action, whether it is uh, rectification in the coating or uh, checking whether pipeline is touching any foreign object or removing that thing from the pipeline, which is causing trouble. Then another method for coating integrity is peel off test. Over a time due to improper cathodic protection current or some chemical reactions due to the material which is used for fixing the coating over the pipeline. It can have some reaction and cause the coating to peel off. It disbonded with the pipeline. So to, to determine the extent of disbondment, we carry out peel off test, which is following a uh, already elaborated procedure. We carry out by having a 25 mm silting across the coating and we peel it off using certain force and based on the readings we get, we compare it with the coating condition and we get to know whether it is suitable for future use or you have to uh, intervene and uh, repair it. This Then this internal corrosion monitoring, like already talked to the like corrosive sub constituents like S2S and CO2 coupled with moisture, they can cause trouble for any pipeline operator in long run. So we have to follow a lay down procedure. We have to install corrosion coupon for monitoring and analysis. They can be of several types like electric resistance probe or electrochemical noise probes. We have to install them at certain locations which are based on certain uh, modeling where we have to use it for analysis of internal corrosion. There are several other considerations also in mitigation and monitoring of this corrosion, like critical angle at angle at which we are entering the gas into the system, what path it follows during its journey from one place to another place, what is the volumetric discharge rate of the fluid which is transported in the pipeline, operating pressure and temperature, biological assays, what type of biocides we have to use, or what is the water dew point or what is the topography of the pipeline alignment? We have to consider these aspects also while designing a corrosion monitoring system. There, these corrosion monitoring system, like we talked about electrochemical noise or LPR probe or ER probe, they can be classified as direct or indirect. Indirect means we get certain readings and we infer what is the level of or extent of corrosion happening in the pipeline. Then selection of the monitoring location. It is very important where we put in the probes for monitoring of external or internal corrosion. Area where corrosion is most severe, it can be predicted through internal corrosion predictive modeling. That's a software based approach or inline inspection. We get the data from inline inspection where the problem is likely to happen or where the problem is already uh, existing. These are some photographs of the electrical resistance probe and linear polarization resistance probe. These ECN probes. This another very useful technique is electrical field mapping probe, which is normally it captures internal corrosion to the range of 0.1% of the wall, wall pipeline. You can see the pipeline average thickness is around 6.4 mm so 0.1 percent of that thickness it can capture whether corrosion is happening at that rate or not another useful method for assessing the integrity is pigging of pipelines picking of pipeline it starts with cleaning picking cleaning picking is very versatile tool it it not only used to clean the pipelines it also gets us uh, all type of impurities removed from pipeline like these uh, corrosion products or some uh, sort of condensates or other impurities which may exist at the time of commissioning. There are several types of cleaning picks. Depending on the 
uses we classify them as foam pig foam pig is very basic pig it is made up of a foam and it is used to assess the pigability of pipeline whether my pipeline condition allows me to run a tool across the pipeline or not if there is any problem this foam pig can be disintegrated due to the force of flood flowing in the pipeline and uh, our operations are not hampered then another is gauge picking it checks out the roundness of the pipeline another is brush pick to clean and scrap the pipeline and magnetic pick to collect the ferrous debris which which are normally formed due to corrosion happening in the pipeline at any point of time you cannot totally avoid the corrosion phenomena happening from the ferrous products whether it is pipeline or any other structure these are some picks of the foam pigs then this intelligent pigs they are very effective means of capturing data of the pipeline by running a tool through the internals these are high resolution magnetic flux leakage tools means we have a tool designed in such way that a high resolution magnetic flux is captured and uh, with the very principle of magnetism if there is any defect in the pipeline that flux which is captured at other end it distorts and uh, its signature is used to tell us whether the pipeline is having any defect or what type of size of that defect it can be determined through this tool there can be several types of intelligent pigs depending on the end use we are putting in whether it is corrosion detection pig or actual flaw detection pick or xyz mapping tool xyz mapping tool is giving us virtual image of the pipeline coordinates of that wave the, like by sitting at my computer if we analyze this data from received from the xyz mapping tool i can create a 3d image of the pipeline and i can very well visualize what type of defect and at what location it is occurring based on that we can uh, plan out our mitigation action and there are different type of capabilities owned by each of these intelligent pigs based on the readings we obtain from intelligent pigs or any other integrity method we carry out the mitigation plan like uh, if we find any there is any mechanical damage or there is any internal corrosion issues we can go for leak repair clamps or pipeline coating uh, yeah pipeline wraps we can use or we can replace the pipeline altogether then another method is direct assessment it comprises of pre assessment like data collection and assessment selection of direct assessment tools and indirect inspection means uh, without digging the pipeline and exposing it for visual inspection we go for software modeling like ecda or icda or terrain modeling for likelihood of stress corrosion cracking or future threat identification of potential area like uh, where it is prone to earthquakes or uh, landslides we can know through direct inspection indirect inspection then direct examination employs various ndt techniques like uh, uh, this uh, ultrasonic measurement or uh, uh, sound measurement we can employ these techniques there are several new kind of technologies being employed by pipeline operators across the world we'll talk it about it later then after this assessment we carry out the reassessment interval or remaining life assessment or effectiveness of the technique we use and based on that we can plan for the future intervention this is a long range ut measurement for carrying out the thickness survey of the pipeline over a short length of pipeline like uh, we talked about newer technologies being available uh, one of that is polymer lining where in these pipelines where we encounter severe internal corrosion we used to line it with this uh, polymer polymer is nothing just uh, we put a sleeve but inside the pipeline by employing some mechanical forces however this technique is not widely used because it is very difficult for cross country pipelines to have such kind of kind of arrangement it can be useful over a very short length of pipeline say in the 
jetty areas or uh, include all pipelines it can be used we have this emergency response vehicle for attending to any emergency in the pipeline this is uh, basically a fire tender model with several amenities which can like gas detection or site barricading or site lighting or checking the pipeline uh, location or depth of cover and lifting pulling leak repair clamps all these can be put together in this emergency response vehicle and it's a very handy tool for any pipeliner then another useful technique is optical fiber cable based pipeline intrusion detection system see uh, this uh, optical fiber cables we are laying along the main pipeline it is basically used for our supervisory control and data acquisition system which is a control system for any pipeline coupled with this uh, we carry out our all our communication on this ofc career as well as uh, we call it a uh, relay effect the effect is that uh, in ofc if it detects any vibration it causes a deflection in the optical image which is captured at the other end and it is used to interpret whether any encroachment or third party activities is going on near the pipeline or near this optical fiber cable where it is being laid so we can have a inference and uh, a, a sort of pre warning that uh, some uh, party is going to excavate near your pipeline or you have to go there and assess what type of dangers or what type of precautions you have to take care another useful intervention is remote methane leak detector see any natural gas uh, it cannot be seen with the naked eye and most of the time it is odorless also so either we install gas detector at each and every location that will be a costly and time consuming affair another method is we are having this handheld monitors which can uh, which can assess the level of methane leaks to the tune of ppms it can give us a forewarning that any equipment is leaking gas or it is causing fugitive emission of the product and we can take timely intervention this another method is this magnetic tomography method this method is again it's a variation of uh, magnetic flux leakage principle this is using uh, villari's effect villari's effect is like uh, if you put any metallic object to mechanical stress it will change the characteristics of its magnetic properties so by measuring the change in magnetic properties we can assess what is the condition of pipeline whether it is undergoing certain thickness reduction which is causing stress changes in the pipeline like that we can infer another is uh, cmdm contact lex uh, magnetometric diagnostic method it is similar to the principle of mdm it again uses a uh, equipment which relies on the principle of magnetic flux leakage and capturing to analyze the condition another useful tool is gis based pipeline integrity management system this gis based or locational based pipeline integrity management tool is very useful tool we use softwares where we wherein we put all type of data which are, uh, for analysis whether it is received from ili or direct assessment or certain other tools we use them to plan our mitigation action to know the condition of the pipelines we identify the threats and what is the probability of those threats converting to potential catastrophic event we score them and uh, we maintain a sort of history with this type of data for every pipeline segments this computerized yeah centralized pipeline integrity management system we can define it like during construction and operation phase we establish and maintain the integrity and during the life cycle of the pipeline if any threat is encountered we employ proper mitigation and this keeps a balance for maintaining the integrity of the pipeline at normal levels
there are several statutory and regulatory requirements for maintaining the pipeline integrity management system for all pipeliners it is driven through OSD 226 or PNGRB IMS regulations or ASME B31.8 as we as a pipeliner we follow these documents we follow these guidelines and maintain our pipeline assets with this uh, I would like to conclude my talk and thank you very much for patient hearing Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Madan Mohan. As expected, I think uh, uh, it was a very well uh, uh, compiled and curated the presentation. And uh, while you were making the presentation, we we were getting some uh, very positive uh, feedback from from all the participants who are who were carefully listening to to uh, the insights you were giving about uh, the oil and gas uh, industry and the safety measures which which uh, are undertaken. Uh, you know, Gale and and when it, when we say Gale uh, follows or, or or follows a path of of certain operations or certain do's and don'ts, then I would it's safe to say that that is the uh, the best practice of the industry, and uh, and I'm sure not only in India but that would be a global best practice. Uh, uh, what uh, Gale would would undertake in its operations, uh, considering that it is one of the largest oil and gas companies in the world um, and the flag bearer of uh, uh, India's uh, uh, oil and gas industry. So thank you so much. Again, uh, one of the key two as aspects which you also touched upon, uh, I think the hazards which are related to oil and gas industry uh, are in two broad categories. One is the, of course, the safety and injury uh, related hazards. And yes. there is the health and illness related hazards. And I think all of that, because in, in, in an oil gas uh, sort of setup, um, you know, with hydrocarbon, dealing with hydrocarbons and compressed gas and all of that, there, you know, uh, it need not be an, uh, an accident of, of, of where the blast takes place, but even a leakage can be, can be uh, very catastrophic. And I think... Uh, yes, sir. Um, uh, you've touched upon very key aspects and the processes which are followed and and uh, uh, been you know taken up in 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 your industry and uh, uh, I think that I really compliment you for that and you also touched upon the ERDMP uh, which I think is uh, the fundamental I would say a book or the rule book for uh, yes. for disaster management planning in um, in oil and gas industry and I think. Uh, uh, I was uh, had joined Fiki back then, but the uh, uh, General Bhardwaj, who earlier spoke uh, uh, in his inaugural address, who was then the chair, uh, the 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 member of National Disaster Management Authority, uh, he and uh, uh, Mr. Labendu Mansingh, who was the founding uh, chairperson of Petroleum and Natural Gas Regulatory Board. Yes, sir. and they they came together along with their experts and their members in the board and other experts from the national authority to compile and develop this ERDMP document, the first ever document. And I and 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 that is something uh, we at Fiki CIDM board take pride in in saying that you know since uh, that document uh, was made public through our platform, we've been propagating those those guidelines amongst the oil and gas industries and. Uh, I think from uh, from from all the oil industries, all the major Navratnas and Maharatnas of of Indian oil industry and gas industry have been very supportive in and uh, and logically so uh, to our platform, to our initiative. And time and again, they've come on board of CIDM uh, conferences and workshops to to talk. Uh, you know, not only ERDMP, which was developed then, but uh, you know the in in, in 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 uh, uh, since then, whatever updations have happened in that document have been duly recognized and uh, uh, appreciated and uh, 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 disseminated on our CIDM platform. And this OTP is also uh, comes from the same uh, tree. It's another branch from the same tree, which is the chemical and industrial disaster management uh, tree, which was. Uh, 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 which has came into existence uh, almost uh, or now over a decade ago. 
um, so thank you so much uh, for all your thank comments you. and uh, uh, we really appreciate uh, the, the 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 detail in which you you uh, you you know you explained all the points which are relevant to all our participants who in fact a few of them also mentioned that how could they even listening to to your interesting presentation how could they actually um uh, you know uh, uh, try and you know they, i'm sure they must be young professionals how they could develop a career in petroleum sector and i think that's that's something uh, very encouraging and on our platform uh, that's what we, we 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 strongly believe in that the participants uh, not taking away from other such initiatives, anything away from those initiatives, but what we do and the sort of participants we we have on our platform are are uh, you know very relevant uh, and the, you know they are they mean business. They are really here to learn, and that is where we are also challenged as as organizers to get them the best from the industry, the best of knowledge and best of best practices from which they can learn and uh, learn as industry professionals also and also from the academia you know who are looking for a career who are, you know who want to make a career uh, can also find uh, the right knowledge uh, uh, in our in our online training programs so thanks again and uh, i i also welcome dr ashish mittal he um, is another uh, um, uh, health and safety professional who would be talking uh, giving his presentation in in coming days uh, thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Mittal. Uh, you have been very supportive, and we appreciate your your uh, support and your guidance in uh, making this program successful. Thank you. Uh, uh, I have list of questions now with me. Uh, one of the things which I wanted to also uh, share with all the uh, participants that uh, once again that you have to attend all the three days of this otp to be eligible for a certificate which will be jointly issued by national institute of disaster management ministry of home affairs and federation of indian chambers of commerce and industry that is FICI. so you have to attend all three days i'm sure if you attend all three days you will end up into being a more uh, you require uh, you know more knowledge and be more learned by the end of these three days uh, the link for all the three days will remain the same as long as you use the same email id so for us we will be tapping webex has a facility of tapping all the attendance of all the participants along with the number of minutes and hours they spend on the platform so we can track all of that so there is no need for an attendance link uh, but use the same email id to register so that we know the same email id has registered all three days so don't uh, do not use other email IDs. Use the same one. It is it makes it easier for us to to track the attendance. So that was an important bit of information. Uh, our videos are being also uh, you know linked to the YouTube channel, YouTube channel. Uh, in fact, uh, they are streaming live on the YouTube as well. So if someone misses some part of the video due to poor connectivity or if there is something which may uh, come up urgently you can definitely visit uh, our youtube channel uh, and search for this uh, particular uh, otp day wise we have a separate uh, link and we stream it live day wise so every day there would be uh, a link which is posted on the youtube to watch this the proceedings live on the channel so moving on now uh, with madan mohanji with us I would also like to quickly check, uh, you know, there are certain questions which we'll be taking up, Madanji. There are Sorry. questions from, uh, you know, based on your interesting presentation, I see a series of questions. Uh, I would have, had there been a speaker after you, I would have requested you to answer them on the window. Uh, but now I have this opportunity that I can ask you these questions live. And yes, sir. First question, sir. Uh, you asked, you mentioned about corrosion. And there's a relevant question from uh, uh, Muhammad Faris. Does moisture gases cause corrosion of the internal part of the pipeline? Yes, sir. Uh, see, uh, when a gas is produced at the well head, it contains lots of impurities like S2S, moisture, carbon dioxide, and other gases. 
before we put in the gas in our pipeline it is striped stripped of all these impurities but still to certain extent say in parts per million some mm -hmm. type of impurities they do happen in our pipeline they do get entry through a uh, production well head so all these impurities if there is presence of moisture they can form a corrosive substance like acids s2s will form sulfuric acid co2 will form carbolic acid and these acids in uh, very small quantities although they do react with our base material the pipeline is made of st uh, carbon steel and these acids they corrode our pipeline the thickness is not much 6.4 mm if you compare it with other structural steels it is very less so 6.4 mm thickness if over a period of time it gets reduced due to this corrosive corrosive substance we can have a failure at that point or we have to replace that pipeline it can lead to a very catastrophic event yes well thank you thank you for throwing um, light on that uh, uh, there was a concern from Pro Pro Mr. Pramod Parekh, who's a very active participant of our OTPs. Um, and uh, he has a list of questions also from for you, Madanji. In fact, uh, there were certain patches on the, he says that there were certain rectangular patches on the, on, during the presentation when it was streamed. But I'm sure on the YouTube, if it's not there, if there is still some problem in, 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 in reading one of these. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, I think uh, the, this is due to network issues at my end, probably. That's no problem. We will we, we will we'll have a copy of uh, the share what you can share uh, with the participants. And if there's something we'll yeah, post sure. online for them to sure, have a sure. look again. Uh, there's a question from him, uh, Pramod Parekh. Is there any plan of blending hydrogen in natural gas distribution pipelines as been done up to five to 10 percent uh, with the purpose of reducing CO2 emission as H2 is a cleaner fuel as part to achieve climate change targets? What are the risks assessed, if any? So yes. at, at present, uh, we do not see that we can uh, add any type of such gases in our pipeline. Okay. To, hydrogen is very dangerous if it escapes to atmosphere. Yes. That can cause the catastrophe unknown, me unknown measures. So we cannot Hello. take this risk. Yes. Thank you. Uh, sometimes we face requests uh, from oil and gas industries during ERDMP mock drills. Yeah. They insist to accept scenarios of theirs, which we do not accept. We give our scenario according. So basically, uh, this question is, uh, you know, when ARDMP related mock drills are held, mm -hmm. uh, are there any um, uh, restrictions to the sort of scenarios which can be which can be determined uh, or or even the extreme scenarios can be taken up in mock drills for ENDMP? Sir, see, uh, for conducting any mock drill outside our plant premises, we have to get the permission from district authorities and district admission, they take the lead in organizing such type of drills. Mm. So we are basically driven from their end. We cannot force them to use our scenarios or what suits our requirement. Uh, we'll like to have all sort of worst case scenarios so that we get a hands-on training to mitigate or mitigate or handle those sort of emergencies but at times uh, district administration uh, you can understand they are also uh, overloaded with their administrative jobs so mm -hmm. th this is sort of uh, uh, lacuna we are having in the system okay uh, there's a question from mr uh, mr huck yeah what is the benefit of pims pims in safety yeah actually pims is a, a software based approach mm -hmm. we we take the help of softwares to assimilate and assess all type of data mm -hmm. and compare it with historical data and it can be used to predict uh, risk and occurrences of failures or chances of failures and it can also provide us an insight that we have to take any entry measures like for example we get data from inline inspection. So it tells us about what is my present condition of the pipeline, what is the thickness loss. So 
this data we can compare it after five years when we again mm -hmm. run the intelligent pig so based on these two segment of data the software model it can predict that your corrosion or thickness loss is happening at this rate and going by that rate what is the chances of failure what is the chances or what is the timeline of reaching to that extent where your pipeline can fail at this pressure or operating condition mm -hmm. so this computer based modeling is only to help us plan a lot of mitigative actions so this is an aid in uh, proper safety planning of the pipeline assets it's a question from Pramod Parekh uh, about the SIS design. He says, has this subject of SIS design identified in for educating process safety designers and managers of future hazardous industries, including chemical, pharma, agro, fertilizers? Sir, uh, this process safety, it's a very vast subject. Mm, uh, mm, absolutely. It's already uh, touched upon by Dr. Uh, Gupta. Yes, it needs so, to be. Yes, all the sorry. industry as well as academia, academia, they have to come together, and this process safety aspect need to be taught to all graduates mm. who are going to join oil and gas industry or any other chemical or allied industries. Mm -hmm. It's a very good subject. So at present, uh, uh, I think. Uh, I'll not be able to answer this question clearly because uh, this, right. a, this is a vast subject and vast subject yeah. and it's an evolving subject also. Yes, I think this is one of those evolving subjects of the of the industry. Um, so uh, Dilip Vasu asks an interesting question because you know we we talked about laying of pipelines and uh, how this network is ever expanding uh, in our country. Have you ever come across a scenario where nearby structure or a building collapsed during the pipeline laying activity or any damage to the uh, uh, structures? And what are the best practices to follow to avoid such kind of emergencies or lapses during excavations to lay the pipelines? Please share some thoughts on this. Yes, sir. This, is a, this is a very good question. So yes. before we lay any pipeline, we carry out a detailed route analysis we carry out the feasibility of the, that route. It depends on lots of factors. We do get a map of the area. We do get a topography survey done. We do get a listing of all the structure or vulnerable location, which may come across our pipelines. So we deliberately avoid all such areas. We try to lay a pipeline, which causes least trouble to already existing structure or uh, habitats or uh, flora fauna on the land so there are very less chances of encountering such type of problems where due to our construction activities in pipeline any damage is there we do get certain type of like uh, if we lay our pipeline through farm areas we sometimes we have to dam uh, this uh, not damage we have to remove the bore wells or other small structures for which we adequately compensate the owner Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so there is very less chance of any accident occurring in the construction yeah. of the pipeline. Yeah. And, and, whatever, and, and whatever damage we do, we, we we rehabilitate or we compensate the affected person. Yes, I mean that's the that's the beauty of uh, uh, you know uh, the modernization of the entire process of industrialization is that you know uh, that is something a responsibility which. It usually yes, yes. the administration, right, yes, exactly. but now it is the company itself. It could be a PSU or a private company, which makes sure that uh, during the expansion work or during the uh, you know uh, networking, uh, expanding the network of anything yes. for that matter, not only guide, uh, pipelines, but even for any sort of infrastructure, any public infrastructure, they take due responsibility of rehabilitating from rehabilitating to. Uh, making sure that the uh, anything which gets affected is left in the same condition as it was earlier. And, yes, you know, and, 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 and we take pride that we are a very responsible organization. Yes, yes, yes. We cannot afford to have such public image that we go and destructing the already uh, existing properties. And I think uh, this also comes from, you know, maintaining that corporate reputation, which we were talking yes. about earlier, which I uh, also briefly mentioned, that 
health illness safety security is definitely one aspect of or, or different aspects or many aspects of industrial safety overall but i think the corporate reputation and the public relations is also equally important in the entire process because yes in this yes competitive exactly world, so. in this competitive world i'm sure even an engineer who's working at the shop floor level uh, during his training he's he's told that you know how um how he should as a as an individual or an employee of a company should take that responsibility or that mantle of of improving the corporate uh, reputation of all, also of the company which which yes, is yes. You know, as important as conducting his day to day duties i think this is a yes. cultural uh, uh, change which has come in the way uh and pleasantly so in the way the uh, the, the public sector units uh, or the public sector undertakings operate and i think a uh, uh, huge huge difference and huge professionalism which has it was always very professional but it has become more i would say in line with the international best practices uh, even the indian psus and i think that is a great uh, moment of you know it's it's a matter of pride for for all of us as indians uh, thank you so much uh, madan ji uh, for that thank answer. you sir uh, what thank you. will be the possible reasons or scenario of fire at a minor leakage point in an underground propane line where evidence of corrosion is evident uh, this comes from hemant bish <coughs> sir uh, for any accident to happen there have to be uh, three causes first uh -huh. is substance which is uh, maybe gas or any other inflammable substance another one is oxygen and third one is presence of fire igniting material fire, fire or uh, any spark Yeah, so unless yeah. these three are combined, there are very less chances of any explosion or fire happening. Mm -hmm. So, and further, in the case of gases, for any explosion to happen, it has to cross a threshold level that is uh, lower explosive limits. Then only it can uh, ignite to such an extent that it can cause any explosion. So, uh, we do not find such type of scenarios happening normally, like where. your pipeline is going underground and you observe a minor leakage and there is a explosion sudden explosion yeah yeah there will yeah. always be some mitigation measures based on visual inspection or through use of certain techniques we do get to know whether any substance is leaking from my pipeline or my assets and based on that uh, we carry out the mitigation action yes uh, in fact one of the questions which was asked uh, i'm just trying to find i read that earlier about the uh, uh you know the how, how far can the welding uh, uh you know of can be done at, uh, around the pipeline all of that one of the one of the very key um achievements i would say of our forum was uh, you know fiki uh, does commercialization of technologies for for drdo and for department of science and technology one of the mm. technologies developed by drdo scientists was a mm. uh, uh, qt alloy copper titanium alloy now that is apparently supposed to be safer while welding yes. because it is an anti it's a non sparking tool yes, so yes. one of the uh, through our process of commercializing technologies one of the organizations called pawa metal tech who uh, this gentleman was working with the uh, one of the uh, corporates in india left his left his job and along with his son uh, acquired this technology and commercialized it today yeah. the same <clears throat> when the tools which he makes so for two it could be a tool from uh, maybe a, a a screw to a big hammer or any 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 tool which is used in industries uh, it's a non sparking tool and he recently supplied the same material and you know cidm was the first platform where he Um, made a public presentation or launched his project, his product. Yes. And today, yeah, was in Hyderabad, I think. Ah, yes, 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 yes. And today, he he recently supplied successfully to a uh, government order in Sri Lanka. Oh, that's uh, great. You know, last week. So, and apart from supplying to Africa and even in European countries, in CIS countries. So, I think uh, with the technological uh, uh, intervention and innovation. constant innovation happening in the area of industrial safety i think that is something we also encourage and promote uh, uh, young minds scientists in the uh, academic structure that is why we encourage 
uh, people from you know students from IITs and other in, um, technical institutes to participate in these OTPs, and they know where the problem lies. See, because knowing the problem is the key to 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 a successful solution or to an innovation. Yes. Yes. I think defining a problem statement and here people like yeah, that, that solves the problem halfway. Halfway. So we 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 we're really proud that you know we can uh, facilitate that sort of uh, a dialogue also where uh, uh, you know young minds and professionals even he was a uh, this guy uh, Mr. Pava he he was you know he had a thirty year old thirty year um, ongoing career with with one of the corporates. And he thought that this was the problem which he needs to solve. He had the technology to acquire that and today doing great business. So this is a motivation for a lot of uh, young entrepreneurs, uh, technical brains to look into this area because industrial safety and disaster risk management overall, the disaster risk reduction or the disaster risk management overall uh, comes with a huge business opportunity angle as well. Uh, yes, yes, definitely. Untapped. It is. It has been untapped for years together, and I think whatever techno whatever business has been tapped, is been done in bits and pieces. But now <laughs> the time, and I think COVID has also provided that time that you know, where people are looking for other options of to innovate to 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 other forms of livelihood as well. You know how they could. Uh, you know, come out of a, uh, a, a working culture to to become an entrepreneur. I think this is one area which provides a lot of opportunity, business opportunities from training, from skill development, from uh, pro equipments, from you know, it could be as and all of that. And everything has a potential, and a lot of things uh, uh, the industry needs them, and I think the, the industry also needs the right solutions, which I think the innovations will sort of fill up. Yes, definitely, sir. Uh, uh, last couple of questions before we end today's uh, sure. OTP. Um, what is the precautions for laying pipelines for underground diesel storage tank laid in chemical industries? If you have any idea, uh, this is a question for Vinod B. Diesel storage? Yeah, for, I, I think diesel storage and I think transporting diesel within the industry through pipelines. Uh, is there any uh, in industries? As a thumb rule, we uh, follow all the precautions uh, like uh, we bury it uh, to the depth of around 1 to 1 1.5 meters. We mm. coat it with three layer polyethylene coating before we bury the pipeline underground. We follow the uh -huh. best uh, safety practices or best uh, construction practices like welding, then uh, selection of material. Then, of course, uh, if we are transporting diesel, we do try to coat it internally so that it does not cause any type of corrosion or chemical reaction in the pipeline. So these mm -hmm. are basic thumb rules for any pipeline, whether it is pipeline, crude oil, or natural gas line, or any product line. OK. Uh, the final question, Mr. Madhumona, I have saved this question for the last. Uh, mm -hmm. This comes from me. I just mm -hmm. want to know. Um, your inputs or your feedback or your uh, reaction on the um, the oil india uh, uh, burst or the uh, uh, incident which has happened in in tinsukia assam uh, a lot of audience uh, of our participants are also keen to know uh, what is your take and what is the government doing and uh, how you think that can be Mm, you know, uh, when will this incident end? Is there any picture from a professional point of view? Sir, uh, speaking about any other company will be unethical for me. But but at yeah, the same yeah. time, uh, yeah. I would like to talk about our own experience. Yeah. See, uh, as we already know, Gale has had its uh, own black swan incident that happened uh, around six and a half years back in yeah. June 2014, where uh, 14. in Ka Kakinara district, we had a very catastrophic pipeline failure. Yes. So, analyzing what happened, what caused this incident, we came to know that uh, the extent of internal corrosion or the chemical reaction happening in a pipeline due to ingress of impurities like uh, CO2, S2S, and moisture, what trouble it can give us. We came to know due to that incident, and, and after that incident, uh, we came back as uh, more resilient, we came back as uh, more knowledgeable 
company about the dangers and mitigation measures we have to take to avoid such type of catastrophe in the future. We have had uh, our policies and procedures and SOPs redefined and uh, we took help from internal national experts. We carried out uh, industry meets in the field of corrosion management. We had our very own uh, series of corrosion conference uh, with the help of uh, corrosion, uh, see this CORCON, NACE. Mm -hmm. so, so we can say that today, after six and a half year, we stand at a place where we can guide other uh, members on this aspect, as well as uh, we have built a capability and we have built a robust system that such type of failures will never happen again in the uh, future life of the company. This I can. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I can't help but take this one uh, last question, uh, Madanji, and then we will uh, uh, say a formal thank you to you. Um, Shankar, he says, is the biological gases evolving from earth around the pipeline causing most corrosive effects on pipelines? What is the effect of methane gas and other gases like sulfur, etc., on existing pipelines and how to address them? Shim Shankar. Uh, yes. It's a good question. Very good but, question. Yes. But, uh, it's a hypothetical case only. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but uh, although these type of corrosive gases, unless my pipeline is exposed to such gases, yeah. it, it will not cause any effect because I protect my pipeline through three layer polyethylene coating. Then I carry out impressed current cathodic protection. We carry out daily patrolling, monthly patrolling. By monthly patrolling through helicopters, we carry out all sort of uh, leakage surveys. So the chances of encountering such type of troubles, it's very remote. It's very remote. So uh, how, uh, Madanji, what is the uh, lifespan of an operational or of once it is installed? What is the life li lifetime, uh, lifespan of a pipeline? Sir, another Usually. good question, sir. If we maintain our pipelines, and it pipelines, comes from uh, Mr. Mohammed Mishal. So last question, yes. If, if we maintain our pipeline with all the precautions or whatever methods we have talked about in the presentation, the pipeline life is indefinite. It can oh. go as long as possible. See, the very first line, first pipeline of natural gas which we laid in 1984, it is still running as good as new. Oh, so we, we, we take pride that we have maintained our systems and pipelines in such a manner that it is as good as new. Fantastic. We have been carrying out all those uh, uh, these surveys and uh, integrity assessments and mm -hmm. we have come out with the finding that our pipelines, our procedures are excellent. Mm -hmm. And we are, we are trying to improve, we are trying to match with global best practices also so that we can further improve our practices. Right. Uh, on that note, the questions keep coming in, but sir, we have limitation of time. We've taken a lot of your time, Mr. Madhu Mohan. Thank you so much for you, uh, very patiently answering each and every question and very diligently answering them as well. I My think pleasure, uh, sir. on behalf of all the participants, uh, I must uh, like to thank you. And I would like to thank you, in fact, for all your time, your brilliant and uh, beautifully compiled presentation. Uh, there are questions which were targeted to um, Sri Anil, uh, uh, Professor Anil Gupta, um, uh, he had uh, another online meeting with the ministry, but uh, he has assured me that he would come back uh, either tomorrow or day after to take up those questions which were related to his presentation. Um, and I would, uh, Harshit is here, so Harshit will endorse that view that uh, he, he has promised that he would come back, um, you know, in one of the two days um, to answer those questions. So participants, I think, uh, you've been uh, very patient, and I think uh, I hope uh, uh, you know at the third day we would also share a feedback link uh, with the participants for their crucial feedback because we are as good as uh, uh, the, the 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 feedback we get. You know the OTP is as good as the feedback we get from the participants. They 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 define they have the final uh, I would say say to the quality and um, uh, to the organization of, of these OTPs, what we present. I think we had a good first successful day. Uh, thanks to our two very eminent speakers, Mr. Madan Mohan. We look forward to having and seeing more of you, sir, in future. I think... Uh, my pleasure, sir. My pleasure. Uh, 
uh, we, we, we are very happy CIDM on behalf of my chairman, uh, General Bhardwaj, our board members, which include Dr. Muzaffar Ahmed, who is a former member of NDMA, uh, Mr. Labendu Mansingh, uh, uh, former founding chairperson of TNGRB, Mr. Rajeshwar Rao, who is the additional secretary and senior advisor in the Economic Advisory Council to the Prime Minister. Um, and with the uh, with blessings of uh, late Sri S. Krishnan, uh, uh, who's the also a former, uh, who was the former uh, chairperson of PNGRB, I think uh, with these great minds, and he continues to to to, to bless us from up there. Uh, it's been uh, um, uh, you know great working with these beautiful and these intelligent minds, and they've helped us compile this program together, and they continue to support us. Uh, Thank you again to uh, Major General M. K. Bindal from NIBM, the Executive Director, uh, Professor Anil Kumar Gupta, uh, Head ER uh, DMS at N NIDM, Harshit, uh, thank you to you and to Dr. Anjali. Uh, special thanks to um, uh, um, uh, our colleague, uh, my colleague uh, Akhil Gupta, Sanjeev Kumar, Mainak Mojundar, and Varun Sharma. Um, we, uh, I would also like to make a brief announcement that FIKI's annual general meeting is being scheduled from on, on the 11th, 12th, and the 14th of December. Uh, Honorable Prime Minister of India, uh, Shri Narendra Modi, would be inaugurating our annual general meeting and the annual convention, uh, which would be uh, on the 12th. He would be uh, formally inaugurating it. It's a very interesting uh, three days of business convention which will be held. And I encourage uh, industries and academia and, and participants here present to, 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 to join us there at the AGM as well. Um, it, it, it gives, it's a very true reflection of what uh, the government thinks. You, know, you will get a true reflection of the, how, how the government is planning, what the policies are looking uh, up to uh, in times to come, uh, when we are trying to come out of this uh, challenge of COVID uh, crisis. Uh, uh, Prime Minister uh, Modi will be addressing the, the audience. It's an online event. Uh, so we look forward to participation from all. We, in fact, very interestingly, um, uh, will be also uh, uh, an, uh, an exhibition which would be launched on the 11th of December, uh, a convention which will, an exhibition which will expo, which will go on for one year. So anyone who participates, who uh, logs on to as an ex exhibitor, will be there on the online platform for one year. So, and we are trying to create an exchange of business, a B2B exchange where active business can keep happening 24 seven, 365 days. So we'll share links in the next couple of days of how you can access that annual general meeting. So uh, on that note, I will uh, uh, say bye-bye to everyone uh, and uh, with the hope that we all meet tomorrow again at the same time as we started today uh, for another uh, series of uh, presentations by uh, eminent speakers, Dr. Jugal Kishore from Sardarjang Hospital, Dr. Sunil Pandey from Terry, and Dr. Ashish Mittal <coughs> from Occupational Health and Safety Management Consultancy Service. So on that note, thank you again, uh, Mr. Madan Mohan. And thank you, sir. Thank you all, all the participants. We look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Thank you the organizing team of FIKI and NIDM for putting a great effort together. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Sanjeev, I think we can uh, be, be done for today, right? Yeah, yeah, we are done for the day. But right. tomorrow, same time, we'll be again joining. 30, right? Yeah. So, uh, I think we made the uh, announcements, important announcements for all the uh, participants. If there is uh -huh. anything we have missed, we can probably show it as the first slide tomorrow. We can yeah. internally with Akhil. If there is any, uh, uh, you know, yes, yeah, yeah. special of do's and you know some some important yeah. points yeah. pointers, so that the uh, presenters can. Doctor uh, Ashish Mittalji, thank you so much for joining us uh, today, sir. We'll uh, we look forward to your presentation tomorrow uh, afternoon. We start at yes. two thirty. And we end almost at the same time. So good same week. Time. Good time. We have started on time and we have finished bang at five o'clock. So no, no, no. Okay. on that note, bye bye, uh, Sanjeev. Bye bye, everyone. Thank you, Arun. Uh, thank okay. you. Thank you bye -bye. so much. Thank you so much.
Bye-bye. Let's talk offline. Bye-bye. Thank you. Yeah, bye-bye.